alcoholic hepatitis is a major cause of morbidity and mortality uh, in this country and is uh, um, in some studies the leading cause of liver-related mortality in this country and also a major cause of liver-related mortality throughout the world. Um, unfortunately, the treatment options for alcoholic hepatitis are not optimal. And uh, um, uh, beyond conservative therapy, which means nutritional support and uh, taking the best care we can of the patient um, uh, with routine uh, approaches, there aren't specific medications that are routinely used by um, all, all physicians to treat patients with alcoholic hepatitis. And this is unfortunate because, as I said, is a, a major cause of death. And so um, one of the approaches that we looked at was a, a um, therapy called a tenercept. And why a tenercept is used for a number of other diseases um, that we think are mediated through a similar process as alcoholic hepatitis, except in other organs in the body. And uh, so that was really the premise for our study, and it was based on uh, a vast amount of um, information available in animal models as well as, a, uh, as well as a pilot study we did here at Mayo Clinic uh, to see if the a drug may be effective for patients. And uh, based on all of that information, we were optimistic that uh, we may have a new therapy for alcoholic hepatitis. Well, I think this study is important for several reasons. One is it has um, uh, given us a definitive answer, um, not just for this drug, but for this class of agents, which are uh, agents that neutralize um, the, the, a cytokine called tumor necrosis factor and have demonstrated that these agents uh, are not going to be the um, treatment uh, that's going to be effective for this disease. And that's very important because um, uh, these types of studies and this hypothesis uh, that this might be an effective target has been ongoing for 20 years. And so this should uh, definitively put an end to that direction so that investigators can focus on new directions and new approaches. Uh, there's a number of other potential targets um, th that I think now will get more attention based on uh, excluding this one. Um, I think it's particularly interesting also from a pathophysiology point of view. Uh, even though this uh, um, the molecule that we blocked, which is tumor necrosis factor, uh, does a number of bad things, it also is apparent from our study that this molecule does a number of good things too. And the fact that it was blocked in our patients, uh, in, in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, and that this ended up with adverse consequences and not an improvement in survival, suggests that um, uh, like many molecules, this one is complex and is doing beneficial things as well as uh, harmful things. And so in this case, uh, blocking that uh, molecule is not, not going to be the way to go. As you know, alcohol has a very rich history uh, that links with mankind all the way back since the Stone Ages, in fact, and that's the first time where we have documentation that uh, humans uh, consumed alcohol was from the um, uh, evidence that uh, the cavemen actually um, uh, consumed fermented fruits and uh, obtained an um, alcoholic um, type response to that. Um, and since that time, uh, alcohol, again, is intertwined uh, um, inextricably with, with mankind. And many of our greatest uh, uh, individuals throughout mankind have, in fact, died from alcoholic liver disease, uh, such as uh, many um, uh, famous uh, military people, many musicians, uh, many artists. And so, uh, um, since then, uh, and now more over the past few hundred years, um, uh, we've begun to realize that um, abstinence for everybody is not going to happen. Alcohol is too linked to our culture in, in many, many cultures. And so that is why, um, uh, with that in mind, we've recognized also that there's potential beneficial effects of low con amounts of alcohol as well. And so really the key is to try to understand why people drink in excess and um, what we can do to help people who drink in excess uh, in terms of uh, um, not just uh, treatments to prevent the addiction but also treatments to prevent the injury that occurs from these responses. Um, uh, despite all of these interventions, as I mentioned, alcoholic liver disease continues to be a major driver of uh, morbidity and mortality. In many liver transplant centers, it's the leading cause of liver transplantation.
and uh, in uh, many countries throughout the world, um, especially in Scotland um, and uh, uh, in that area, uh, alcohol-related uh, um, liver disease is actually increasing in prevalence. Um, in our country, uh, alcoholic liver disease continues to rival with uh, hepatitis C and non-alcoholic fatty liver is the most uh, important drivers of liver-related mortality. I think it's uh, interesting uh, in terms of the terms of moderate alcohol consumption means very different things to many different people. And um, most of the data would show that um, for men, uh, drinking up to um, two, perhaps three drinks a day is a safe range. Perhaps one drink a day may even be beneficial. For women, that range decreases um, and in fact, women are more predisposed to develop alcoholic liver disease for a given level of alcohol consumption compared to men. So for women, the relative risk for developing alcoholic-related liver disease increases even with two drinks per day. And so it's a, a lower threshold for women. Um, that is a genetic factor, you can say, and the genetics of the disease are also expanded uh, in the sense that certain uh, um, people have a greater genetic predisposition to develop alcoholic liver disease than others. We don't understand what is the alcohol gene right now, but it's very clear that some people can drink very heavy and never develop liver-related problems, while other people uh, can drink in a more um, uh, moderate to heavy range and develop problems. Most uh, people would say that um, to develop alcoholic liver disease in men, most commonly people would be consuming um, more than 40 grams of alcohol a day and that can translate into uh, perhaps four drinks a day. Uh, but it, again, it really depends uh, at a personal level how you mix your drinks. And some people uh, make their martini with the equivalent of three drinks in it. <laughs> and so uh, um, that's why the term moderate alcohol consumption can really uh, vary from person to person. I think the important thing is uh, um, uh, to be sure that your alcohol consumption is not in excess. And really with the lack of good pharmacologic therapies we have, uh, you have to be your own doctor and um, avoid the problems. And it's similar to many other health-related problems is that uh, avoidance and prevention is um, much more effective than treatment later because um, uh, the treatments are not always effective. I think that an important point for patients is that uh, if you uh, develop jaundice or yellowness, people notice your eyes are getting yellow, anything like that, that's probably uh, one of the simplest um, uh, ways that a patient can know if they're starting to get into problems with alcohol consumption. Uh, they often know also from the people around them if people are suggesting that they're worried about their alcohol consumption or if they're drinking in the morning or if they're feeling uh, guilt associated with their drinking. Um, uh, if people have suggested that they should cut down on their alcohol consumption. These are all signs and symptoms of excess alcohol consumption and then uh, the development of the yellowness in the skin or in the eyes is a good sign that um, that alcohol consumption may be starting to really affect your liver in a serious adverse way. We are uh, taking um, many different approaches here in our research program. We have a very active and a large program in this area and this spans the um, areas from epidemiology of alcoholic liver disease, trying to understand better what are the trends in alcohol consumption uh, and what are going to be the future trends and how those link with development of liver disease. Um, uh, we also have individuals uh, who are interested in the links between alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and whether alcohol um, in, in small amounts even may make other types of uh, liver disease worse. Um, uh, we are also interested in various mathematical and prognostic models to help uh, physicians to diagnose alcoholic liver disease from other types of liver disease and also to help predict um, how severe someone's alcoholic liver disease is using simple laboratory-based uh, pathways. And then lastly, in terms of treatment, uh, we're evaluating newer therapies as well. Some of the directions that we're interested in are uh, linking to um, the role of uh, bacterial products from the gut 
and how those may uh, contribute to um, development of alcohol-related liver disease since alcohol affects so many different parts of the body. Um, there's a very close interaction between the gut and the liver. Uh, another area is uh, relating to uh, insulin resistance and alcoholic liver disease and whether therapies there may be helpful. And then we're also interested in potential protective pathways that can be um, uh, um, improved by um, therapies so that way your body can protect you uh, from the damages of alcohol. I think the important point, as I said, is that uh, it's very important for individuals to try to uh, um, keep their alcohol consumption in, in uh, moderation or um, avoiding excess alcohol consumption on a regular basis and uh, uh, despite our attempts to keep finding better therapies, uh, prevention is really uh, uh, the cornerstone uh, to attack this disease.